everyone. Hi. Hi. What a beautiful night in Athens, Georgia. Are you guys as, as excited to be here as I am? Yeah. Well, nice. 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 So this, this is probably my favorite night in the entire year. Um, this is only my second three-minute thesis, and I have to tell you, after last year, I walked away amazed, inspired, and just awed by what some of the students are doing, and most importantly, by their ability to, to communicate what they're doing to an idiot like me, because I don't do any of the stuff that these people are describing. I think what you're going to find by the end of this night is that you're going to know a lot more than you do now. Um, you're going to be even more impressed with the students here at UGA than you are now. And you're probably going to be challenged to some extent. My guess is when we keep you out and the judges are making their decisions, you'll be thinking about some of the things these students have talked about. You'll probably be talking to people about them, about those issues. And you know, quite frankly, I think that's a lot of what Three Minute Thesis is all about. Um, again, I'm really excited to be here. I cannot tell you how important the work is that you're here about today. And I invite you to sit back, um, enjoy, get ready for a wild ride, get ready to be inspired, and just absolutely, absolutely awed by what our students do. So enjoy the evening. Make some more noise. Come on. Yeah. And let's give it up for our MC. She said, let's give it up for our MC. <laughs> The woman. <laughs> Welcome everybody. So, another three minute thesis. Uh, I did this last year and uh, I couldn't agree more. You, you, you genuinely will be astounded uh, by the things that you hear here tonight. The people, the students at the University of Georgia are doing some incredible research and um, I had the, uh, the pleasure of serving as a preliminary judge, uh, or a judge for some of the preliminary rounds for the three-minute thesis, and every year I'm just, I'm blown away. It's an incredibly difficult decision to figure out who's going to come here tonight for the finals, but uh, rest assured, everybody you're going to hear from tonight is incredibly accomplished. So, a little bit of background first. Um, basically, what we're talking about here is a competition People come up, they have three minutes, only three minutes. If you go over, we, the, a trap door opens on the stage and you fall through. So you have three minutes to explain a project, generally a thesis, or at least a, a major component of your work, uh, to uh, an audience of non-experts, uh, people like me, who don't understand any of this. Um, it was developed by the University of Queensland in Australia. And um, I, I did an Australian accent last year, and I had to do it again this year. <laughs> so good. Um, it's, it, it hasn't gotten any better. Um, and the University of Georgia held its first three-minute thesis competition in 2012. So our judging panel tonight, if you would please raise your hand or stand up so everybody can see you. Uh, Heidi Davison. There she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peggy Gallus, Shelly Nickel, James Patel, and Athens' own intrepid reporter, Lee Sher. Thank you all for serving as judges tonight. So, the rules, I'll let you read through that while I mumble away, but it's pretty simple. You have three minutes. Uh, you can't. You have one static slide. It can't have any animations. It can't have any explosions. You can't play whistles. You can't uh, shoot fireworks off the stage. I apologize. No strobe lights. No fog. No uh, no guitar solos. Nothing. Just three minutes. Your voice and one static slide. So this is the fundamental judging criteria. Basically, the way I like to think of this is: uh, Did you understand what you heard? And did you enjoy understanding what you heard? Uh, it's, it's really a pretty simple thing to, to say, but it's a much more complicated thing to do. Uh, and our contestants have all put in a lot of practice uh, to try to make their research not only understandable, but compelling. And then finally, you, you have to... <laughs> you have to have prizes, right? <laughs> So, 
actually, that's that's probably copyrighted. I, I can't I, I can't play any more than like ten seconds. Of that. Um, the winner gets a thousand dollars. I said a thousand dollars. Runner up gets seven fifty and the people's choice. What's the people's choice, James? Well, every single one of you should have come in here and got programmed this evening, right? Inside that program is a list of people's names with a little checkbox next to it. You also got a free pen. You can keep it, right? They can keep it, right? But you can keep the pen. Um, so watch all the presentations. Wait until the very end. You never know your favorite one. Maybe the last person who presents. And then put a check mark next to the person that you would like to win for People's Choice. We'll take all those together, we'll tally them up, and then we'll tell you who the People's Choice winner is after the show. Okay? With that, I think we're ready to begin. This is a good crowd. When did the bar open? <laughs> all right. Our first presenter tonight is Mackenzie Carter, and Mackenzie's title is, or her talk is called Small Animal Medicine and Surgery. No. Nope. That's actually not. <laughs> Small, oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> customized testing for canine treatment. That makes a whole lot more sense. <laughs> God, Mackenzie, that's a terrible talk. <laughs> How many of you have a pet dog? Well, you're not alone. 54 million households in the U.S. have dogs. And if you own a dog, it's likely that you consider them to be a family member or at least a really close friend. Unfortunately, for the thousands of known diseases, there are only about 700 treatments approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in pets. Drug discovery is a long and arduous process. It can take billions of dollars in over 10 years to take one drug from the bench top to clinical trials to your home and your pet. So what can tissue engineering do to help? Well, we can make test systems to test drugs that are more accurate and give us a better idea about how drugs act in the body. Currently, drugs are tested on flat, two-dimensional sheets of cells that are not representative of natural tissues. We know tissues aren't flat because dogs aren't flat. <laughs> um, using different materials, we can create a three-dimensional architecture on which to seed cells and let them grow. We can use materials like ceramics, plastics, even paper. Like all living things, cells behave differently in different environments. Imagine living in a cozy tiny house or an opulent mansion you're going to behave differently, and so do cells. What's more is we can change the way the cell feels about its environment. We can make the surface smooth or rough or soft or hard. And we can tell the cells how to behave using chemicals and nutrients. We can tell the cells to grow, to divide, to change their shape. Using all of these techniques, we can build a 3D system to test drugs on that gives us a better understanding of how drugs, drugs work and which ones are effective. My research focuses on making a model of canine panosteitis, an inflammatory disease in dogs. If I can make an accurate model, we can understand how the disease progresses and which drugs are effective. Creating more accurate models will enable us to speed up drug discovery, reduce costs, and bring better care for your pet at home. Thank you. Up your, your time. <laughs> I already admitted to everybody that I'm stupid, but now I'm just, <laughs> just proving it to you. So uh, we have a little bit of a short period of transition where we have to change microphones and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I have to I have to fill that void with uh, with humor. <laughs> So that last talk was about three minutes, right? I've got some, I got some fun statistics for you. Shut up. 
Things that happen in three minutes. One million forty one thousand six hundred and sixty six tweets are sent in three minutes. You can do the same thing using hashtag UGA3MT. I, was, I wasn't kidding, you should do that. Um, there are $610,000 in Amazon sales every, every three minutes. I didn't say that these were all going to be fascinating, I just told you that this is what's happened in three minutes. Please tell me we're ready for the next presentation. <laughs> Excellent. So, next up we have Kara Wyatt, and Kara is going to be talking about Tibble 2. I actually know that's how you say that. <laughs> Tibble 2, your friendly neighborhood flu fighter. Kara. Are you afraid of needles? For me, it always hurts to get a shot. And in a study conducted in 2012, it showed that roughly 23% of people actually avoid their yearly flu vaccine because they're afraid of needles. This is a high number, but it's not surprising given the current anti-vaccine climate. Some people believe that vaccines cause autism. They don't. And others believe that we don't even need a vaccine. And we do, because vaccines not only protect you, they can protect everyone around you as well. Many of these issues with vaccines can be easily solved by just talking to your doctor. But what do we tell people who are afraid of needles? Well, we basically tell them to suck it up because you can either get the flu shot or potentially suffer the consequences of actually getting the flu. There is one other alternative though, and that's to the use of the intranasal flu vaccine. This vaccine is administered exactly how it sounds. It's a vaccine spray given within the nostrils that should confer all of the protection of the flu shot without the pain. That's not exactly how it went, though. For the 2016-2017 flu season, the intranasal flu vaccine was removed from the market because it was so ineffective. That's why one of my research goals is to potentially find a way to increase the protection in the intranasal flu vaccine. The way that we hope to do this is by understanding the role of the protein tipple 2 within the lungs during an influenza infection. Tipple 2 has already been shown to have many different immune functions. Specifically, when Tipple 2 is present, it can actually decrease susceptibility to listeria, tuberculosis, and other parasite infections. Therefore, we believe that studying Tipple 2 in the context of influenza makes sense. The way that we're actually studying this protein is by isolating the main targets of influenza, infecting those cells with virus, and then analyzing the activity of our protein during the early hours of infection. The reason why we're looking at the early hours of infection is because this is the time of the innate immune response. The innate immune response is initiated within the first seconds, minutes, and hours of infection. You can imagine your innate immune response being very similar to an EMT or police officer coming to the site of infection to help control the infection. Therefore, we're trying to understand how Tipple 2 is able to control the infection. So far, our results have been promising. We've seen that when the protein is actually present, it can lower death rates and decrease symptoms. There's still a lot of work to be done in both understanding the role of Tipple 2, specifically within the lungs, and even more work before we can move forward with any vaccine studies. So please, continue to get your yearly flu shot, but just know that we're trying to make flu season a little less painful for everyone. Thank you. So, uh, in the last three minutes, seven of you got, seven of you got the flu. Um, Two million one hundred and four thousand one hundred and sixty seven Facebook logins in the last three minutes. Any of them in this audience? Of course not. You're riveted. <laughs> 15 earthquakes, 1,080 lightning strikes. I think about a thousand of those happened last night at my apartment at midnight with a cat sitting on my chest. Like, make it stop, human. I'd love to, cat. All right. Are we, are we ready for the next presentation? Excellent. So, 
Next up we have Johanna Monloy Gabrele. Is that That's that, good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and her talk is titled Blue Brown Rouge, Women of Color Writing Themselves in the French Space. Les femmes de couleur, which means women of color in French. You might wonder why it's just a little bit grayish, right? I try to add a little color to my words, but I only added 6% brown. And you might just wonder why 6%. This is not a random number. 6% is actually the percentage of non-white women that you can see on French national television today. Just 6%. You might wonder why that number is so low. And for me to even begin to answer that question, we're going to have to go back in history and talk about colonization. You see, colonization never happened on French soil. It happened overseas. It happened in Africa, in Algeria, Morocco, etc. It happened in the Caribbean, in Martinique, Guadeloupe, etc. But it never happened on French soil. As a matter of fact, slavery was forbidden on French soil which means that brown bodies and different bodies were never really thought of as being part of the French public space. And issues of race and racism for the longest time were thought of as just a foreign concept. So back to present day. In a country like France that does not recognize race as an identity feature, my dissertation analyzes how women authors, writers who have some Caribbean or African heritage put the two together the two being race and identity. They retell the stories of these women of color and they retell their struggles in trying to belong to the French space. Some of these struggles might have to do with language. After all, French is the language of the former colonizer. Some of these struggles might have to do with recapturing their own history, the history that's been erased by the violence of colonization. Some of it might have to do with just racism and discrimination in France. You might just wonder why I study literature. You see, France never had a civil rights movement forcing it to confront those issues about racism and discrimination. Therefore, I argue in my dissertation that literature and art in general are the canvas for us to start thinking critically about these issues in France, especially today as we see crises of nationalism and populism. My women authors that I analyze in my dissertation, they put these women of color front and center, out of the shadows and into the light. These narratives are the many stories that are hidden behind that 6%. Thank you very much. John, I have to tell you completely candidly, I thought I had messed up what your slide came up with. Oh, no. uh, that guy's got a point. <laughs> yeah, this is a microphone, yeah. So he needs to go over here. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. All right. Yeah. Kind of I got to tell you, the reading these statistics off after every one of these talks feels more and more trite and, and less. Everything I. 94,800 tons of water just flowed over the Niagara Falls. It's not even an issue, is it? 174 planes took off around the world. Fantastic. UPS delivered 33,957 packages, but I have the one thing from Amazon that is not there yet. <laughs> All my package, UPS. 750 babies were just born. Okay, I'm an anti-baby audience. Huh? <laughs> you don't have to be happy about it. Okay. Our next speaker, Jatendra Pant. And he will be talking about artificial skin substitute for... Burn injuries, please. Please raise your hands if in the last one year you got a small cut, a burn, or even acne on your face. Please raise your hands. 
Thank you. <clears throat> the other day, my girlfriend came to me crying. Honey, I've got this pimple on my face. I don't look good. I cannot go out today. Now, this might sound funny to a lot of you. But imagine, a small acne on her face made her so upset that she did not want to face the world. Think of a burn victim. How do they feel? Every year, 1.1 million people are hospitalized for the treatment of burn injuries in the United States. United States Army soldiers are also the victim of burn injuries, which happens at the combat field. So why is our skin so important to us? Our skin is important to us because it is our identity. It represents our ethnicity, our race, our nationality. And who don't want to keep their identity? Don't you? My father always used to say, son, always find a purpose in the things that you do in life. So the purpose of my PhD research is to bring happiness in the life of these burn victims so that they don't have to mask their identity. The purpose of my PhD research is to make artificial burn, artificial skin substitute for the treatment of burn injuries. My skin substitute is made of nitric oxide, which is naturally produced in the body for the, for the wound healing. I have combined it with hyaluronic acid. So when I combine hyaluronic acid with nitric oxide, it increases the proliferation of new cells at the wound site. At the same time, it also increases the formation of new blood vessels. So overall, it is enhancing the overall wound, uh, wound healing process. So why is my wound healing agent better than the one already existing in the market? Reason number one, the currently, the currently available options are costlier. For example, if you do a skin surgery or a plastic surgery, you have to spend a lot of money and not everybody can afford it. Reason number two, people rely on the use of antibiotics for the treatment of skin injuries. Now statistics have shown that Antibiotics use can kill more people than burn injuries will ever do. So isn't it a wonderfully ridiculous idea to use antibiotics for the treatment of burns? And without realizing, for the last three decades, we have been using it. So the purpose of my research is to bring happiness in the life of every person so that they don't have to mask their identity and they can smile with confidence. Thank you. So, you know, you wake up in the morning and you, you have a pimple and you don't want to go on. I, 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 sometimes I wake up and I, I look in the mirror and I'm just like, oh, it's you. Here we go again. Anybody else have that feeling? No, it's okay, it's just me. You know what I'm talking about, though? If you're, if you're below 30, probably not. You're probably like, oh, my skin's perfect. This is fun. <laughs> Reach a certain point where your hair starts to fall out, and you just like, what the hell's happening to me? Oh, oh well, no, let's go face right. the day Wait, anyway. Yeah. Sorry, this took a decidedly maudlin turn. 8.34 million YouTube videos we just watched, though. Oh, just Oh, okay. Uh, 450 emails were sent. I swear there's somebody in my office who probably sent about 400 million of those. Oh my god, really? 2,916,666 Tinder swipes. I don't know if that's both left and right or just right. In either way, it's that is a depressing statistic. You're funny. Let's make sure. An entire book has been written on the first three minutes after the big bank. The big bank? I didn't write these down. I think that's supposed to be the big bang. But the big bank sounds far more impressive. Whatever, let's, let's hear from somebody smart, shall we? Carly Phillips, Carly's going to help us out. Carly's talk is called who run the world, Carbon and Beyonce? As a 
graduate student, I spend a lot of time thinking about my two passions, Carbon and Beyonce. Beyonce because, you know, she's Beyonce, and Carbon because where Carbon ends up in the soil, the ocean, or the atmosphere is hugely important for understanding how our world will change, what the world will be like for our children, what the world will be like for Beyonce's unborn twins. <laughs> I research soil and tundra, which means I spend most of my time getting up close and personal with 50% of the world's soil carbon. For my dissertation, I try to understand why microbes, the bacteria and fungi in soil, release CO2 to the atmosphere through decomposition and how the expansion of big woody shrubs might accelerate this response. And so because I spend so much time thinking about these two hugely important subjects, it's hard to not draw parallels between the two. For instance, Beyonce, while always an important part of the global music ecosystem, Destiny's Child, <laughs> has only recently blown up in her influence and dominance, which can be traced through her multiple number one singles and groundbreaking visual albums. <laughs> and for shrubs, they've also historically been an important part of tundra ecosystems. But in the past 50 years or so, as the Arctic's begun to warm up, we've been able to track an increase in shrubs' range and size. So basically, shrubs are the Beyonce of the Arctic. <laughs> the more important parallel, however, when we're thinking about carbon cycling is that Beyonce has a way of making those beneath her lose money. Think about it. She gave us her most recent album, Lemonade. And then because I experienced that cultural triumph, I had to go <laughs> onto Etsy and buy a Don't Worry Beyonce cup, empty my checking account for Formation World Tour tickets, and then dip into my savings to cover an I Woke Up Like This t-shirt. <laughs> so despite Beyonce putting this irreplaceable capital into society, I as a consumer end up spending and releasing more of my own stored money in response. And the same is true in the Arctic. Shrubs have a way of making soils beneath them lose carbon. Shrubs provide microbes, us in this scenario, the currency of biological systems carbon in the form of roots and leaves. And they provide more of it than other tundra species because of their increasing range and size. And while we might expect that more carbon coming into the system would increase the amount of carbon that's stored in the soils, what my research is actually finding is that the microbes beneath shrubs are releasing CO2 at a faster rate than the microbes beneath other tundra species. They might be using shrub carbon to invest in enzymes or to invest in larger populations, but they're using that to fuel the breakdown of older carbon. But unlike with Beyonce, when microbes break down, CO break down carbon, it doesn't go back into the global economy or even back into the shrub. It goes into the atmosphere as CO2, which can accelerate global climate change and create problems for all of us, even one as flawless as Beyonce. Carly, I'm going to have to ask the remaining contestants to not be funny because you're making me look worse than I already am. So, uh, jokes, uh, so last minute rule change jokes are now forbidden. Sorry. No, I haven't messed with it. Yeah, no, you can still tell jokes, it's fine. Okay. Um, this is one, where, where is this? This, this? this actually kind of yep. broke my heart. Uh, do uh, the average American in the last three minutes earned 28.8 .8 cents in salary compensation. Oprah made $1,572. Bill Gates made $45,000 in the last three minutes. Let that sink in. <laughs> Burns a little, doesn't it? Okay. Okay. So coming up next, we have Megan Prescott. Megan's talk is called "In the Present: Bacterial Proteins as Vaccine Candidates for Tuberculosis." Megan. If you were to think of a recent disease epidemic, what comes to mind? Zika? Maybe Ebola? what about tuberculosis? When we here in the United States think of tuberculosis, we may not think of a major global health crisis. We may picture Satine from the movie Moulin Rouge, a cabaret girl from the 1800s who succumbs to the disease in a poetic death on stage. Much like cabaret or the Moulin Rouge, TB is seen as a relic, 
a narrative device that indicates a story is set in a past where the thin frames and pale skin of TB victims was glamorized. But TB isn't a relic, nor is it glamorous. The lung disease, whose primary symptom includes coughing up blood, has surpassed HIV and AIDS as the leading cause of death from an infectious disease worldwide. One out of every three people are infected with the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And although mostly in the developing world, as seen on the map, 10,000 of those people are here in the United States. So what makes tuberculosis so bad? For one, many strains of the bacteria have evolved to resist being killed by all currently available antibiotics. So even if someone were to be treated for the disease, they won't recover. For another, the only vaccine used to prevent tuberculosis hasn't been improved since 1921. That's only six years after the Moulin Rouge burned down. And this lack of improvement isn't because the vaccine works. For the most part, it doesn't. So if we aren't able to treat the disease and we can't prevent it from occurring in the first place, what can we do? My lab's answer is to build a better vaccine and to stop the disease before it starts. We can do that by studying how the bacteria causes illness and using that knowledge against it. We specifically want to know which parts of the bacteria cause the human immune system to throw up a red flag to indicate that a pathogen is invading. When humans are exposed to these biological red flags in a vaccine, their immune system will develop a memory of the bacteria and they'll be able to recognize and fight off the bacteria if they ever come into contact with it. I specifically study a protein the bacteria makes called R35 that might just be the red flag the body is looking for to mount a defense against the bacteria. We chose this protein because bacteria that have R35 removed do not survive as well as normal bacteria and are able to be killed by human lung cells. This leads us to believe that this protein is important in causing tuberculosis disease. If we can use R35 or proteins like it to make a better vaccine, then we may be able to stop the spread of tuberculosis and maybe one day eliminate it altogether. Our hope is that one day TB is just a relic and the only people that die from tuberculosis are the ones in the movies. Thank you. Very nicely done. Okay. Um, let's see. Every single one of you blinked an average of 36 times in the last three minutes. 36 times. So that's about. 4,572 blinks amongst the audience. Fascinating, I know. Did I thank Meredith for these statistics yet tonight? <laughs> Meredith Welsh Divine, everybody. Hey! Funny thank you. All right. Please, John, rescue me. John Speakerman. John is, John's talk is called Thinking tall, breathing small. John. Think about what it would be like if there were no breakfast. So this means no coffee, no McDonald's McGriddles, and most agonizingly, no Waffle House. A typical breakfast from any one of those places rakes in about 1,000 calories. So I'd like you to compare that to what a farmer in West Africa or what a farmer in India eats. A farmer in these regions survives on about 600 calories a day, and these calories are based around a crop called pearl millet. Over 500 million people rely on pearl millet as one of their primary sources of calories, yet it's still considered what we call an orphan crop. So this means there aren't many genetic resources available that plant breeders can use to produce the best possible varieties that farmers desperately want and need. So it's my job to figure out what farmers want and study it. And what they want are dwarves. And they want dwarf varieties for two simple reasons. The first is that cereal crops like pearl millet grow really tall, and they accumulate grain all the way at the top. So this means they can actually just fall over. So due to this simple misunderstanding of gravity, farmers can lose up to 40% of their crop this way. So simply put, dwarves are closer to the ground, they don't succumb to falling over, and they still produce a significant high yield. The second reason is that dwarves produce a ton of leaves, and this is also really important, because farmers use those leaves as forage to feed to their livestock. So to study how dwarves are produced, I study plant hormones. So just like we have hormones that course through our bodies, plants have hormones that travel through their vasculature and are translated into vital signals. 
the most important plant hormone of all is called auxin. And auxin is translated into signals like how tall to grow. And because we know that dwarf plants can't transport auxin as well as tall plants, I study one gene involved with transporting auxin throughout the plant. So I dive headfirst into the networks and pathways associated with that gene to figure out if we can better understand it and also figure out if we can further manipulate it to produce better varieties that pearl millet farmers want. So, the next time that you're at Waffle House at 2 or 3 a.m. and you're scarfing down a 1,000 calorie meal, I'd like you to think of a quote. And the quote is from a Nobel Prize winning plant geneticist named Norman Borlaug, who's actually pictured behind me on my slide. His work has been credited with helping feed an additional billion people on the planet due to dwarf varieties of wheat that he helped produce. So the quote goes like this. For all beings brought into this world, food is a moral right. And as a PhD student, it's my job to continue that legacy, to make sure that farmers have the resources they need in order to feed themselves, their families, and the 500 million people that rely on them. Thank you. Nicely done, John. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Oh, well, this is appropriate. 362,019 pounds of edible food was thrown away in the last three minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 16,324,200 pounds of garbage was created, too. Which I guess means that 362,000 pounds of that was edible food. Whoa. I know. So, are we ready for the next presenter? Okay. So, next up, we have Kaylin Washna. And Kaylin is going to be talking, her talk is called Making Atlanta Memory and Heritage if you've ever been to Stone Mountain Park, east of Atlanta in DeKalb County, chances are you've seen the laser light show. For 45 minutes every evening in the spring and summer, colorful laser beams are projected on top of a carving of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and former Confederate President Jefferson Davis. At times, the image of Martin Luther King Jr. has even been projected on top of the mountain. This type of juxtaposed imagery of a Confederate heroes and a civil rights icon is exactly what I study. My dissertation seeks to understand how civic leaders, business elite, and politicians in the mid 20th century came together to try to craft a unified historic memory for Atlanta. As the self-proclaimed birthplace of the modernizing New South movement, the city also adopted the slogan, quote, the city too busy to hate during the civil rights movement. However, the city had long sustained a brutal system of Jim Crow and with that segregation. So how do you mix all these ideas together? Well, more often than not, it meant forgetfulness, if not downright amnesia, but it also took crafty rebranding. It took a lot to take a place like the top, which is Stone Mountain in the 19 teens and 20s, that hosted Klan rallies to transform it into the bottom, which is a southern amusement park of sorts. Again, Atlanta is the ideal place to study historic memory because it's not only home to Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell, but it's also the birthplace of MLK. Now, historians have long studied the formation of his memory around the Civil War. However, only recently are we beginning to understand the changes and challenges that occurred throughout the 20th century, namely by the Civil Rights Movement, and what effects this really had. These debates and struggles are most clearly seen in historic tourism sites revolving the Civil War, such as Stone Mountain, where individuals and organizations have both sought to define and also profit from these memories while controlling the past, but also the future plans for development. So you might ask yourself, why does any of this matter? <laughs> In the summer of 2015, you might remember um, renewed debates over the flying of the Confederate battle flag. And with that, Stone Mountain had made history again. Some wanted to blast it off, some wanted to add figures like King to the carving. These reflect continued racial tensions. 
The other reason why is heritage tourism is vital to economic development in the state of Georgia. Places like this have the ability to either reinforce whitewashed one-dimensional images of the past or they can help us understand the complexities of our history and include more nuanced voices such as those from the African-American community to help us paint a more vibrant, a more accurate picture of our past which of course helps us understand the present. Thank you. Very nice done, thank you. Um, remember how I was saying these all feel kind of trite and dumb? They, these, these feel particularly so. A hummingbird could have flapped its wings 12,000 times in the last three minutes. Everybody likes hummingbirds, right? Uh, a sloth could have traveled 39 feet. <laughs> I actually kind of like that one. It's so slow. Okay. Shall we proceed? The next speaker is uh, Leah Zano, and she will be talking about visualizing proteins tagged by HET1. Please. been in a store and noticed how a tag on an item influences how you interact with an item. For example, with, <laughs> if I went into the store and saw bolt A, I would think that's an expensive bowl, but it would look good in my future corner office as a candy bowl. But I can't buy that and eat ramen noodles for the next two weeks, so I'm just going to walk away. However, if I went into the store and saw bowl B, I would pick it up and with it being inexpensive, I would purchase it and use it as a dog bowl. That way, if my dog ruins it, it was inexpensive to begin with. So you may have noticed that these two bowls are the exact same bowls. However, I interacted with it differently because of a tag. There was a difference in how I interacted with it, the final location of the bowls, and the purpose of the bowls. And believe it or not, there are proteins inside of our bodies that behave the exact same way. The enzyme that I work with is HAT1. HAT1 belongs to a family of enzymes that adds chemical tags to proteins. By adding these chemical tags to proteins, it changes how the proteins interact with one another, the location of the proteins, and the purpose of the proteins. HAT1 has also been noted to be apparently high in certain diseases, such as colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer is a disease in which 1 in 20 people will develop some type in their life. We believe that because HAT1 is high in these cancerous cells, it's causing more proteins to be tagged and causing them to become wild and crazy, like shoppers on Black Friday. So <laughs> to determine what proteins have been specifically tagged by HAT1, I have engineered the tagging pocket of HAT1 so that it is bigger. A bigger tag pocket allows for HAT1 to add a modified tag onto proteins. The modified tag can then bind to a fluorescent label thus allowing me to visualize what proteins have been specifically tagged by HAT1. So far, I've been able to obtain this engineered HAT1 and show that it can um, put these uh, modified tags onto peptides. And currently, I'm using this design to determine what proteins are being tagged in colorectal cancer cells. By determining what proteins are being tagged by, by HAT1, we, this can aid in the formulations of therapeutics, as well as give us a better understanding of the roles that these tag proteins play in the disease state. Thank you very much. Very nicely done. Is everybody having a good time? I'm delighted to hear. Sadly, we have but one more contestant. I know, I know. You're just going to have to wait until next year when we do this again. So our final speaker tonight, let me make sure this thing is working properly. Mm, yes. Our final speaker tonight is Maria Cristina Huerta Diaz. 
and she will be talking about a novel approach to vaccine development. Maria. So, vaccines. I know vaccines again. I think most of us in this room have either read or heard about whether vaccines are actually good or not. Time magazine says they're neatly one in 10 Americans think vaccines are unsafe, even though there is a mountain, literally a mountain of scientific evidence showing that vaccines do help us prevent diseases. An example of this is the poliovirus vaccine. Because of this vaccine, we have gone from 15,000 cases of polio paralysis in the United States alone before the 1960s to zero cases of this disease in the United States today. So this gets me thinking, why are so many people against vaccines? I think one of the major problems, if not the major problem with vaccines, is that a lot of people don't actually understand how vaccines work. If we think about what the purpose of a vaccine is, it is to prevent people from getting infected with pathogens. They work by training your immune system to recognize that particular pathogen the vaccine was made for, so that when you do get infected with the pathogen, your body will recognize it and it will prevent you from developing disease. Another misconception about vaccines, especially vaccines of a virus, is, is that most or all vaccines are just a different version of the virus. And even though this virus is weakened, it is still a virus, and parents just don't want to inject their kids with the virus. But what if I told you these are not the only types of vaccines out there? This is where my research comes into play. For my project, I am working on developing a vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Even though RSV is the most common cause of lower respiratory tract infection in children in the United States and worldwide, there is currently no licensed vaccine. The vaccine I'm developing is an amplifying virus-like particle-based vaccine, or AVLP for short. An AVLP is a particle that looks like a virus, but it is not a virus. To make this particle, we use another virus called parainfluenza virus 5, or PIV5, which is a virus that mainly infects dogs, but it has been shown to infect humans without causing any type of symptoms or disease. This is very important because this makes PIV5, shown here on the left, the perfect shuttle to carry the main RSV protein recognized by your immune system, shown here in orange, leaving us with our vaccine, shown on the right. The neat part about this technology is that it can be used for other pathogens as well, not only RSV. So, apart from developing a vaccine against this virus affecting millions of children worldwide, I am validating this technology as a method of vaccination against other future pathogens to come. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So let's give everybody here a round of applause. Eh? Yeah. Once again, I, I am bowled over by the, the, the incredible research that takes place just, just a few blocks from this very building. It's, it really is inspiring. Um, so what is everybody going to do before they leave the room? You're going to vote. That's right. Rock the vote. You're going to fill this out. There will be a place to put them as you go out the door in the back. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes, let the judges uh, tabulate all their scores, and then we'll reassemble uh, over there uh, across the hall. It's actually called the lab, but it's the room directly across the hall from the, from the theaters. And we will announce our winners there. So we'll see everybody in just a few minutes, okay? Thank you. <laughs>